Frank's Red Hot is the perfect blend of flavor and heat. So you can use an entire bottle to make recipes like buffalo chicken dip or buffalo nachos. Or even things that don't start with buffalo. Frank's Red Hot. I put that shit on everything. Hey, Craig. Hey Jeff, just ready to recap an exciting, never mind, no, no sort of <laughs> weekend to recap. Uh, yeah man, buys. hey, basketball didn't lose, basketball did not lose a close game. Uh, so, you know, neither, you know, f- went 4-0 in terms of not losing this weekend, uh, tremendous weekend in terms of not losing for the Cougs. Right. Uh but yeah, uh, I you know it's it's a weekend like this where I kind of you're 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 just like it feels like even though it's only been you know a week since they played when you're sitting there on Saturday because they're not playing and they haven't played earlier in the week it feels like they have not played in forever and it certainly helps or it certainly doesn't help our podcast content. No, uh, and then the fact that they've only played that they took two weeks off, played for two weeks, and then took two more weeks off, like to play basically four games in a month and a half is like <laughs> it's like messing with my head, man. Yeah, that is rough. It is rough, rough. and it's made life rough for us uh, here. Uh, podcast versus everyone, um, episode one fifty six. I'm Craig Powers. With me, as always, is Jeff Newser. Um, Jeff, yeah. so we don't have basketball game to recap. We will get to previewing this weekend's games of teams that they have already played. So I not, don't know how much there is going to be yeah. left to say there. Um, but, but first, uh, well, I guess the women's team hasn't played any of the team, teams they've played. Um, but, but, uh, I guess we'll start with, you know, they've had, we've had some movement. On the recruiting trail, some commitments mm. this week. Um, it's kind of interesting. Now in the era of a, a very Twitter uh, active football staff where you kind of see these recruits before they commit a lot more without having yep. to pay a ton of attention. You know, I'm just sitting there on Twitter and I see Landon Roten, Luke Roten get offers Kendall Williams get an offer John Matier get an offer and then a couple weeks later a week later they commit and and so you've already kind of looked into the guy which for me it's it's been kind of nice you know you kind of already know a little bit about him and so it's it's it it, there's there's like an openness uh, uh to to the recruiting now but so given that we've we've we obviously look at the guys before they commit a little bit and then look at them after um what do we, you know, what are you thinking on these four that have just committed? And let's start, of course, with the quarterback, because that's always the headliner. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, John Mateer from Little Elm, Texas. Six, a okay, couple notable things. Uh, he's six <laughs> foot, 200, which is a running back. <laughs> uh, I'm size. sorry, Craig. Uh, six foot and one half inch. I'm sorry. Six and foot and one half pounds. inch. He definitely Come on is now. Not, but what's most notable is that, you know, and and I don't know what, what you think. I want to hear your thoughts on this. So the one position that historically WSU gets decent recruits in and, and can kind of recruit with the big guys and, you know, maybe not the big, big guys, but still pull four stars, high three stars, his quarterback, uh, John Mateer coming in with a two-star rating. And does that kind of, does that worry you? 
Does it matter? Uh, what are your thoughts? Right off the bat, I was like, oh, really? You know, we're just, this was a guy that uh, Eric Morris had offered an incarnate word. And, you know, of course, FCS level, you're, you know, guys are generally playing at the FCS level for a reason. We went over why, you know, Cameron Ward, uh, you know, probably ended up at incarnate word, you know, I mean, he's, he was, you know, six feet tall and kind of pudgy, you know, when he was in high school. And then, um, all of a sudden he becomes six, three, two twenty, and the arm's pretty good. And, you know, maybe even gets a little bit better and, you know, and he's, you know, put in a system where he can shine and okay. So, so a guy who, you know, maybe wasn't super impressive as a high school player and there were other reasons to, you know, playing time, whatever, but it's just basically guys that end up with FCS offers and not high major offers, typically there's something, something there, right. That keeps them from that. And so, you know, when I saw this guy had, you know, tons of FCS offers and, uh, central Arkansas was, you know, where he was committed to go play. Um, you know, my first thought was, all right, well, you know, (laughs) you know, something's obviously wrong with him. Um, but you know, when I watched the film, I did, you know, I didn't see a guy that looked like a two star recruit. Um, I was actually pretty surprised by what I saw and I'm obviously not a, uh, you know, professional quarterback evaluator, but I could pretty quickly see, uh, what it is that Eric Morris sees in this guy, uh, really accurate guy, uh, excellent pocket presence, very quick release. Uh, in fact, that was like the first thing I noticed about Cam Ward. And then now I'm watching this guy throw. And to be honest, they, they throw kind of similarly. Um, it's a, it's a little bit three quarters, very quick, quick, quick release, quick trigger. Um, this guy is, you know, he's not very tall. So that could be what it was that, um, was kind of getting in the way. You know, if you're not going to be very tall, then you better be, you know, really good at other things. Um, but he is really athletic. Um, we might say he has deceptive speed when he starts to run. Uh, he's fast. He's really fast. His, his, uh, I want to say his 24, either his 24, seven or his huddle says that he runs a four, six forty, which, you know, that, that seems, I don't know, maybe that's a little fast, but when I watch him run, he's legitimately, he's got some legitimate wheels. So athletic kid, good pocket presence, uh, not the greatest arm, you know, pretty average arm, but you know, as we know, arm strength is something that actually can get better. Um, so that's not the biggest concern to me. You know, the, the stuff that you see, uh, that you'd want to see from an air raid kid that you're going to develop is, you know, quick release, accurate passer, uh, you know, good at scanning the field, figuring out where, um, you know, where the open guys are and, you know, comfortable in a, in a crowded pocket, you know, he can move around a little bit, just very comfortable passer, um, which stood out to me right away. So, you know, he's, he's not the kind of guy that you would go, wow, you know, he's, he's got tools. And if they just develop, then, you know, he's going to be spectacular. I think, you know, we have a quarterback on the roster like that in Xavier Ward, you know, he seems like that kind of guy. Um, you know, when you've got Cam Ward coming in and, you know, and it's pretty clear there's not really a path to starting anytime soon. Um, you know, you're kind of maybe limited a little bit um, on what kind of quarterback you're going to get. And and so I think that, you know, it seems to me that Eric Morris went kind of with what he knew he could get, um, went and got a guy that he believed in, thought he could develop. Um, you know, and if nothing else, I mean, if he doesn't turn into a, a stud quarterback, um, he certainly looks like the kind of guy that could be, you know, sir, at least at the very least a serviceable backup, um, in this offense. So yeah, I'm pretty, I, I was surprised when I looked at the video, I guess that's the biggest thing is I was surprised. Like I expected to be disappointed and, uh, and I was, I was far from it. You know, maybe it's cause my expectations were low, but, um, he definitely doesn't look like a two-star kid to me. When I see two-star kid, I see a kid does not belong at a PAC 12 school, um, when I watched him throw, I was like, eh, yeah, yeah, I could, I mean, short, but I could see it. I could definitely see it. You know, I mean, he's, he's not any shorter than Drew Brees or, you know, and that's maybe a decent comp to the way that he plays. Um, so yeah, I mean, if he turns into that, you know, I'm pretty happy, I think. So what I'm hearing is he's the next Stetson Bennett. He's going to lead there us we to go. a national championship. I think he might even be bigger than Stetson Bennett. <laughs> He is bigger than Stetson Bennett already. <laughs> he definitely looks thicker than Stetson Bennett. Hey, he looks like if a, if 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 five eleven one ninety is good for Georgia, then six foot yeah. eight and a half two hundred is good for Wazoo. My, uh, my fav- obviously, by the way, my favorite thing about Stetson Bennett is, is that he looks like a uh, he looks like an NCAA football fourteen video game glitch when he's yeah. on the field. That's my that is by far my favorite thing. 
Yes. And so now we have one of our own. Uh, so, uh, so he, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting because we've seen, he, obviously how coaches evaluate guys, how, and how, you know, this, these services evaluate are different, but we've seen guys around this level do preferred walk-ons with WSU. Yeah. So that's a, that's a pretty interesting thing, but you know, we'll see. Obviously, I think the the big thing what you said is that he is he's not going to play right away. He doesn't need to play right away. They brought in Cam Ward to play right away. You, you have Xavier Ward. Like it's he's he's not going to be the starter on day one. He has time to develop. That's important because um, obviously we've seen uh, walk ons and, and things like that have success at WSU. So it's. It, Whatever I, I still, you know, it is weird to me to pull in a two-star quarterback when it's typically a, the high, you know, your highest recruited position in every class, which it actually is in this one. If you think of Cam Ward as being the highest recruited position, um, yeah. uh, so a couple, a few other guys. Um, so I. A couple offensive line, defensive line. I don't know if both the Roten brothers are coming to play offensive line or is one a offensive line, one defensive line type thing. He just lists his defensive line. But he's a little smaller. So you got the you got Landon Roten and Luke Roten, who I assume are twins. They look very similar. Yeah. Two more Texas <laughs> kids. I'm going to go ahead and assume that. But Landon playing tackle is listed at 6'5", 300. Luke playing – Listed at defensive lineman is six five two sixty five. Perhaps that's the slight variance in their star ranking. Um, so yeah, they come in. Uh, Landon looks like a typically sized air raid offensive lineman. That big, big ass dude who's got to take up a lot of space because they're playing those uh, wider, uh, wider splits. So to me. Looks like a guy. We definitely saw Leach bring in guys like this. You know, Cody O'Connell comes to mind. They're just big dudes that can fill space. And, you know, and that seems like the type of guy he's got right here. Yeah. And then. It's... No, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I was saying, Luke, it's. I it's, was just going to say, it like. Looks, Luke is either a guy that could develop into that or, or that, I mean, he's a guy that maybe could play nose tackle. Because he's already two sixty five coming in, he's six five. He obviously could fill out. So that's a, those are my thoughts on these yeah. guys. Yeah, it's it, totally the same. Big big bodies. Um, you know, just look. We knew that this recruiting class was going to be a little weird, uh, given the you know the change in coaching staff. Um, you know, and, and, and not just the change in coaching staff, but the way that the whole last thing went down, like you just, you just knew it was going to be weird. And this is the outgrowth of that. You know, you've, they need some bodies. They, they had only signed one offensive lineman in the early period. Uh, they haven't, uh, signed any transfer linemen yet. And of course, uh, we know that Mike Leach was famous for bringing in five or six offensive linemen in every cycle. Um, and I, I don't know that Eric Morris necessarily will do that, but it would not shock me if he and, you know, Clay McGuire, who obviously was Leach's, uh, offensive line coach back then, um, at WSU, you know, if he would, you know, be pushing for the same thing. So, you know, you get some big bodies, you know, hope they fill out. Um, you know, they, they, hopefully they project and, you know, at this point you just, you kind of need some depth. You, you just need to add some bodies to the pile and, um, you know, maybe they stick, maybe they don't. Um, but you know, if these are, you know, sort of, we're getting down to the last, you know, handful of guys, um, in the class. So, uh, you know, without a coaching staff that's out there to, you know, pull some big names, um, you know, kids, then. You know, you do this and, and you kind of maybe reset for, for next year a little bit. Uh, you know, try and maybe get some more impact guys. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, one more offensive lineman with Kendall Williams. And so you got just, like you said, filling out bodies. Yeah. I mean, there's obviously some concern about the, the you know, the overall quality of the recruits in terms of average rating, things like that. Uh, but we'll just have, you know, like you said, this is weird and we'll, we'll see where, it, where it goes. Um, they, they have brought in some decent guys, so they do have that capability. So it'll be interesting to see if they can, 
um, you know, when they have a full cycle can do, uh, even better. So, um, yeah, so recruiting, there's our recruiting talk, uh, you know, super hyped as always to talk about, uh, high school kids. Uh, my favorite thing, you know, Jeff, I know you spend all day with high school kids, so you just love to come home and I do talk about high I school do. kids some more. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, uh, football doing his thing, uh, signing days and, uh, very soon, um, the next sign, the other signing day, you know, like, like what in about a week or so, February yeah, I think it's a week, second. Uh, yeah. week from today, I think. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, which is not quite the signing day that it used to be obviously, but nope. it still will be a pretty big one for WSU given that it, they have, the Cougs have quite a few, uh, spots left to fill on their, uh, on their roster. So you can already see, yeah. uh, quite a few guys, uh, that, that'll be inking well, that day. Yeah. I was going to say what the other thing that's interesting is they have a lot of slots left to fill if they want. Um, Dickert has said all along, he's going to take the maximum and, uh, the maximum is actually a, a little more than the 25 that we're used to. It's actually 32, uh, mm-hmm. when you count transfers. So it's like, and they're only at 18 at this point. So with transfers yeah. with transfers. So it's like, yeah, I mean, there could be a ton more guys, you know, maybe they've, you know, maybe they got their, their pulse on some guys that are maybe, um, a little more highly regarded, but. I don't know. It doesn't really seem like it when you're on Twitter. I mean, you referenced that earlier, like uh, the guys that are popping up with it's so excited to receive my division one offer from Washington State University. And then you look them up on 24 seven. You're like, yeah, OK. <laughs> you know, it's like, again, that's not the end all be all. But, you know, it's a pretty good uh, it's, you know, in the aggregate, it's a pretty good reflection well, of the yeah. actual talent level. And sometimes so. you look at who you're battling for the recruits sometimes yes. and. Yes, and when they're fighting, you know, Mountain West schools for some, FCS schools for others, it's like, okay, are they really winning this? Or they just literally have to go Pac-12 and they win the recruiting battle because that's all right. you have to do with kids like that. So, right. Um, so yeah, hate to, hate to go down or like that, but, but yeah, it's like, but you know, I, ideally some of these kids that they're just now bringing in, they're, they're not immediate playing time type guys and and uh they're not they're not this like bod super bottom of the barrel where they're gonna like ruin the program as long as they are given time to develop and everything um and then there's guys that surprise us you know obviously um but uh yeah um in aggregate when wsu has recruited better and in those rankings has been higher They've had some pretty damn good teams recently. You know, those, those 2017, 2016, 2018 type teams, those were built on some, some of their best recent recruiting classes. So it does matter. Um, it matters for yeah. sure. Yeah. It matters if you want to be a consistent, uh, you know, eight, you know, seven, eight, nine or eight to 10 type winning or a every fifth year potentially a good team that a team that's good enough to win those 10 11 games and then the other years you're treading water to get to four or five or six wins which is kind of wsu's history typically before leach came along um you know except for that those glorious three years under mike price in a row of 10 wins but um typically the history has been uh you know waiting until you have a shit ton of seniors and then you're good. Um, and, and I don't know, man, I'm not, I'm not ready to go back to that yet. <laughs> no, me neither. <laughs> me neither. I'd like to, you know, I, I rather like this, uh, bowl game every year thing that we got going on. I, I would like to keep doing that. That'd be good. Yeah. All right. So, um, next up we'll talk about, uh, I don't know. Now nah, we, it's not even, fat long you know long enough to take a break uh but obviously we fingers crossed have some hoops games this weekend uh yeah. the men have two um playing rematch with utah on third wednesday and then colorado on sunday my least favorite combination of games when this makes it so that oh yeah no alumni that live out of out of the general Pullman area are going to go to these games because, because you have a Sunday night at seven o'clock game and a, and a Wednesday night game. So 
Yeah. yeah, me as the season ticket holder for the Cougs, which already is hard to get over there, and you don't pick that many games, you know that weekend is automatically out. <laughs> You're definitely yep. not going that weekend. Uh, but if but you know if you really want, you could watch two uh, double headers: a Wednesday and a and a Sunday double header with the men and women, and then a Friday women's game. So if you want to go to Pullman from Wednesday to basically Monday morning, uh, you can watch uh, five basketball games. Um, yeah. but if I was still in the, school, I'd I'd be yeah, that'd I'd be, be all over that great man. weekend. Yeah. Um. So let's talk about the the men's games first. Uh, WSU getting a bump on uh, Kempom as I'm clicking the mouse. They were 53 earlier. They were 51 when I clicked on their profile. They are 50 now. Uh, just shooting up the the ranks. We jumped three spots uh, Probably because Colorado beat Oregon. I'm guessing that's why. Yep, it's because Colorado beat Oregon. I think is what helped them do that because they haven't played Oregon yet, but they have played Colorado. Um, so yeah, playing Utah on Wednesday uh, today. If you're listening to this when it came out, um, you know they they whooped up Utah pretty good last time. Uh, they're big. Brandon Carlson hasn't played, didn't play that game. That was the first and has not played since. They said it was an appendix out, which, um, you know, I don't know how long it takes to recover from that, but don't know if he's going to play. I tried to look it up. Couldn't find anything on that. Um, uh, the quote says, I think there is a chance for sure. We certainly feel better about yeah. him playing Saturday than Wednesday, but there's definitely a chance he could play. That sounds to me like a coach trying to make sure that the Cougars are distracted and prepare for Carlson is what that sounds like to me. So yeah, I'd be surprised. And, and even if plays. he does play, it would be probably pretty sparing since he has not played in yeah. you know a month. So uh, he's, it's a big deal that he, d- he didn't play in the first game. It's a big deal. He's not playing in this one. Uh, he's their best player. Uh, yeah. He, he's big offensive player for them. Uh, huge shot blocker. Uh, one of the best in the conference. Um, b- big deal that he's not playing. Uh, or, or I doubt, even if he does play, I, I, I don't imagine too many minutes uh, that he'll play. Um, and it was a big deal that they didn't play the first time. So WSU obviously won the first matchup going away. Uh, they were able They were able to take care of the ball. They were able to hit some threes. Uh, they were able to run that pick and roll in the first half. What can they do to replicate another win against Utah? Yeah, I mean, and I will say they didn't actually take care of the ball that well, but no, they, they've no. done worse. <laughs> yeah, they. You know, I man, I'm real curious to see. I'm really glad we got Utah first. Uh, obviously, the weaker of the two teams. Um, again, you know, coming off a break, an unplanned break, uh, for a little while, which, you know, again, totally sucks. And, you know, just kind of, uh, steals away, you know, whatever it is that, you know, you were trying to build. And, you know, one of the things that I think I've come to conclude about this season is just the role that the, um, that the interruptions have played and not just on a macro level, but also a micro level. Right. So, you know, it's, it's not just, you know, games getting canceled. That's, that's the macro level and, you know, team has to go on a pause and, you know, whatever. Right. So that's obviously disruption, but you know, they've had guys just in and out of practice, you know, it's, and that's like, man, when you got two new point guards, essentially, right. Basically two, two, your two new, your two ball dominant guards are new. Um, you know, you're trying to figure out how to make all that work. You know, last year you didn't really spend a whole ton of time focusing on offense, you're a really defense forward team. Um, you know, and so this year you're thinking, all right, you know, and time to emphasize the offense, time to kind of get that rolling. And, you know, they came out of the gate nice and hot. And then of course, you know, <laughs> injuries started happening, sickness started to happen. You know, they had the flu go through the team. They had COVID they, you know, played a couple, t- a couple weeks and then, you know, we got COVID again and it's just, man, it is, uh, they, they just feel very, very snake bit. And, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know how much, uh, you know, of an impact that has had, but I'm, I'm coming to believe it's more of an impact than I gave it credit for, um, potentially in the moment a little bit earlier this season. Yeah. And 
it's got to be it's it's got to be tough mentally to deal with all of these frustrating losses on top of injuries and covid and interruptions like that just kind of weighs on you and especially if you know you're trying to keep a bunch of uh, 18 to 22 year olds invested uh that's tough and and it's obviously uh it's this has not been the season that we expected quite yet and and has not been the season that they expected so i'm sure there's some frustration but then they get that win over cal and you got to think maybe they felt a little bit of a monkey off their back to finally finish a game and then they're probably pretty excited to go play oregon who seemed you know ripe for an upset uh and don't tell that to you dub um and and then you and then you (laughs) you know you uh you you play uh Oregon State, who you can definitely beat, you know, you have a chance at, you know, at least a split on the road, potentially if you can play up and beat a team that you have beaten in the past, you know, uh, you, you can get a big sweep and keep the momentum going, but then bam, you find out you're not playing those games. It, it just, there, it's gotta be a wait, you know, and, and so that's, that's a, that's a bummer. Um, but, you know, Utah, it's, it, it that without Carlson, you know, it was much easier for WSU to shut them down offensively. Really, the only thing that Utah was able to do well offensively was shoot, get to the free throw line and shoot free throws. Um, we'll see uh, if the uh, if the officiating crew gives them that same uh, help this time. Um, yeah. So it's it, it they definitely had some help and 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 it's. And they hit most of the free throws too, twenty twenty four. So, um, and still with that, they were point nine one because WSU pretty much locked them down. Did not give up many offensive rebounds, seventy five percent. They could WSU could probably could do even better than that in this game, and I would hope they could. Um, and I, you know, truly, you look at WSU. Utah does not force many turnovers. If they can cut down on the turnovers they did in the last game. You know, down to ten from thirteen. If they're playing the same number of possessions, uh, then that's three more shots you're getting up. That's at least probably another three to four points you're getting. Um, there's it. Even if they don't add, you know, I think they could probably add a couple offensive rebounds. I think they could. Uh, so if they don't hit twelve of thirty from three, you know, I think they still have a shot to, especially if Carlson's not playing, to to beat this team. Uh, fairly handily, and I, I would, but it also depends on the guys that WSU has, uh, which if they have those core that they had in Utah, which they should, um, I, I think you know there's a good chance they could win that game. I feel good about it, and hopefully it's not close, and they they don't need a 19 point lead. Hopefully they get to a 19 point lead, and then we know they'll win. Um, but <laughs> yeah, so yeah. so that one. Um, hopefully they can get that one on Wednesday and, and, and start the week off. Right. And, you know, I can be, have a happy Wednesday night. Yeah. Losing that game would be one of those, uh, oh shit. We're, you know, sinking farther down into the toilet. Like not, not that it's actually the toilet, but just like, you know, the feeling that whatever hopes we had for the season are just slipping farther and farther away. Um, you know, as we've said, you know, at some point you got to win and, um, this is, this is one of those games like me, you know, this is a game that you got to win. Um, so, you know, they, you know, they got to win this course, one. Who was sitting fourth before the games today, but who's sitting fourth in efficiency margin during Pac-12 play? Yeah. WSU. But yeah. saying eighth in the standings, of course. Right. Um, of course. So, yeah. So this is just a game that they're playing a certain way, but not – the the wins aren't reflecting it, obviously because of some just kind of meltdowns they've had. Um, yep. So no meltdowns in this game. Come on, just beat beat their butt again. Yep. Uh, and then S- Sunday's the interesting one. Colorado's gonna be their third game in what f- five days, six days? Or so Colorado yep. played tonight, Tuesday night, as we're recording. Uh, they just beat Oregon. Uh, on the road, what the fuck are you doing, Oregon? This is going to pertain to a question later. Um, <laughs> no, God damn, uh, they're so maddening. Oh my god! But can we get that Oregon and not the Oregon that won both games in LA? Yeah, 
Yeah. Uh, please. Um, whenever the hell we play Oregon. I don't know. <laughs> uh, um, whenever that yeah, happens. So, so Colorado, that game was probably a defensive low point. Uh, pretty bad defensive game for WSU. Yeah. And quite honestly, an offensive high point. <laughs> like it was, that was such a weird, such a game. weird game. Yeah. <laughs> It just didn't make any sense. Another frustrating close loss where WSU led in the second half, all that stuff. But, like, nothing made sense about it. Uh, you know, WSU play. you know, they were – I mean, it was a high possession game, 75, but still, giving up 1.1 to Colorado's offense is more than you would expect this defense to give up. Colorado is, for a Pac-12 team – uh, you know, kind of an average-ish offense. So you kind of expect WSU to hold them to 1.0 or less. Uh, but to give 1.1, because that's what was so frustrating about that game, WSU's 1.04 should have been enough to win. This I'm talking about points per possession. Sorry if I, if I didn't uh, yeah. specify that. But so uh, Ken Palm has, you know, WSU, because, you know, WSU at 50, Colorado at 77, even after, you know, after their win today, they jumped up a bit. But... What, what does WSU need to uh, turn around to flip that result? Well, they got to defend the interior better. Uh, that's that's the Mother biggest thing. Mother fucking you know, Evan Batty. Yeah, God, like I'm going to see that guy in my nightmares, and he's going to be 46 years old on his you know 18th COVID year in Boulder. Um, I don't know how that dude still has any eligibility, but apparently he does. Uh, I, I, you can't convince me that he's not cheating and actually has exhausted his eligibility. Um, the funny thing is, but, he's actually know, only played. This is only his fourth season of playing. No, that cannot be true. That means he could be back next year. Yeah, 2019 was his. Oh my god, year. I don't believe it. He's just I been. Don't believe that he's just been so goddamn annoying. Cause, well, he played 50 plus percent of minutes and was a and was like a. A, a like fixture in their offense and like Fuck. from the get go. And he's God, just been he so annoying. According to Ken Palm has lost a total of five pounds in that entire time. <laughs> yeah. I don't believe that either. Um, yeah. I mean him yeah. and Jabari Walker, you know, are, are obviously both very, very good. Um, I felt like in a lot of ways we were victims of the way that game was refed. Um, and I'm not saying that, you know, the refs, cost us the game or something. Cause I, I, you know, I will very rarely do that, but um, you know, my disdain for the way PAC 12 officials officiate is well established. Um, you know, they just, they, they have a tendency, you know, bigs get fouls called on them at a way, way, way higher rate than everybody else. Um, you know, they just have, uh, you know, a, a need apparently to assert themselves by blowing their whistle Um, and that game at Colorado was, was really like that. Colorado was, you know, they had foul trouble too. Um, but it's just that, you know, Batty and Walker were able to kind of, uh, you know, toe the line the rest of the way, even as they were, you know, sitting there with, you know, four fouls, um, down the stretch, we were not able to, um, you know, I think as I've said before, our, our bigs tend to a lot of times look like they're trying not to foul. And that is the easiest way to get a foul called, um, is to, to look like you're trying not to foul somebody. Uh, in the post. So I, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm curious to see what Kyle Smith has cooked up for that game defensively. Uh, we zoned a lot in that game to try and uh, try and neutralize their bigs and try to protect our bigs. And, and it just, it didn't work at all. Uh, yeah. So I'm, I'm curious, you know, maybe what they try to do. Uh, maybe if they try to zone, but, but change up the personnel a little bit, you know, I mean, last game they went, uh, which, you know, again, they, <laughs> was a while ago, but, uh, you know, Ryan Rapp played some pretty decent minutes, not huge minutes, but, you know, like five or six minutes of, you know, rotation in that zone. Being big at the top longer. of the zone. 
Yeah. yeah. So maybe they try some of that, but whatever it is, they got to, they, they just, they have to do better against those two guys. And, and you got to figure being at home, they're going to get a little friendlier whistle. Um, you know, that's, that's really where home court advantage comes from, which is yeah. you know, pretty well established at this point. So maybe you get a little friendlier whistle. Uh, maybe they get another big body back. Uh, I don't know what, you know, Deshaun's uh, status is. I, I would imagine DeWolf would at least be available um, to, to yep. play some minutes at the five. So, uh, I think all of those things would help. I, I would not be sad to see DeWolf just come in and, you know, just beat the shit out of somebody for 10 minutes and, you know, really just kind of, you know, be a body and, and hit some people and, you know, just kind of be tough. Um, I, I well, think yeah, there might be some value in that. That's what's a little, you know, worrisome is, is Deshaun started, played 17 minutes, five fouls in that first game. F.A. Yep. played 24, five fouls. Gay luckily only had three. Yakimovsky had four. You know, anyone that they were playing in any sort of interior role yeah. was getting called for fouls. And, and you know, yeah, and like you said, it happened to Walker and Batty and and, uh, and, and Colorado's backup big, Lovering. Uh, they also were on four. So, But, you know, obviously WC had two guys foul out. And, and Colorado's a pretty big, you know, pretty, uh, you know, pretty big starting lineup they start a 610 a 69 and a 68 bulky wide guy um so yep. they're they can, they can be tough to handle they're very good uh rebounding team uh, especially defensively and that's that takes away one of WSU's advantages but WSU can make up for it on turnovers hopefully they can get some easy buckets off those turnovers. Colorado's pretty turnover prone. WSU is not. WSU's good at forcing turnovers. Colorado's not. Um, so hopefully they can get some easy buckets off that. And yeah, and, and then just defensively, yeah, just, yeah, they can just guard the interior better. It, too many easy buckets in the last game. And it, and it was so frustrating because they had the offensive night that they needed and they just didn't get it. And hopefully, you know, just, yeah. That that home whistle flips things, the five points that need to flip, or you know the three points each way that need to flip, and, and WSU comes out. I think it'll probably be close. I, it, there's just uh, it, that front line of of Colorado is just kind of an issue for WSU, and and, and kind of a tough matchup for WSU. So I I think they'll give them some trouble. It just if if they can just you know, miss a few more shots and turn the ball over a time or two more. That's the difference. And, uh, yeah, so it's, it should be a defensive, you know, what we thought before the first game, it should be a defensive battle. Maybe at like a higher pace defensive battle, you know, some ugly high pace basketball, but we'll, we'll see. It wasn't last time. It was still high scoring. Um, so yeah, but Hey, you know, beat Utah, beat Colorado, That'd be a pretty fun weekend and, and a nice springboard yeah. to the rest of the season. Yes, it would. I I I agree, man. Let's do it. All right, so let's uh let's take a break. Um, then we'll talk uh the women's hoops uh week they got coming uh, three games, and then we'll also we have a bunch of questions from Twitter that we're going to answer for y'all. So first, we'll take a break. And we're back. Once again, I've lied. I forgot to mention that we also are going to talk about beer. Uh, so, Jeff, <laughs> I, would, I would love to hear what you are drinking. Well, I got to admit, Craig, it's a little boring. But oh. it, is, uh, it is the old standby. I got, uh, I got a Lucille IPA from Georgetown. I thought uh, you were going to say Bodhi Zaffa. No, no Bodie tonight. Just Lucille. Just, just a Lucille. So I got a Lucille tonight. I also have though my, my backup beer, my, my sidecar. I decided to start with the IPA. Uh, but if I'm, if I'm feeling, if I'm really feeling it tonight, I also have a, uh, 
three sport day lifestyle pilsner from everybody's brewing that was given to me <laughs> as a given to me as a, as a Christmas gift uh, if I feel like drinking it. So, so yeah, that's what I got. What about you? Well, what do you think of the Lucille? I want to hear. I want to well, hear I, your notes. I love it. On I keep Lucille. I keep buying it. So you know, love supporting Georgetown. I love everything. Why do you buy Lucille talk- and not Bodie? Or do you buy both? Well, because because they had Lucille at Costco and not Bodie. <laughs> That's weird. Your Costco's weird. I, my I Costco even, is totally weird. This is why I keep. My this Costco, is why I want to move to Tacoma, Craig. This Tacoma is why I'm Costco moving. only has like Bodie and Johnny. Usually, I don't. They had oh, Bob's God. last time too. I but I don't, I don't remember ever seeing Lucille at Costco. The, Maybe like a while. ago. Beer at the Puyallup Costco. Frankly, the beer section there kind of blows. Uh, it's it's not great. So. Uh, so yeah, they usually have Lucille. I haven't seen Bodie there in forever. Um, but yeah, you know, if they got a Lucille and it's fresh, I'll, uh, I'll usually pick up a six pack and, and that's what I did here. And tonight I was like, you know, I, I think I feel like a nice little Lucille. So that, that's what I'm having. That's what I'm having. And I love, love Georgetown, love supporting them. Uh, love their, love their beers. So I'm yeah. Yep. And uh, as always, I will say folks, if you're buying Georgetown IPAs at Costco, you know, there's there's a risk that they have been there for a while. So yes, what I recommend is feel free to check the date and then feel free to look at the bottom of the palette because yep. you'll see the fresher beers down there. And then be that dick that moves the beer out of the way to get your cheap ass Lucille, which is like four dollars cheaper than you could get it at the normal yeah, store. <laughs> it's like ten bucks for a six pack. I'm, I have definitely done that right in front of a Costco employee. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like bending over. I'm looking down. I'm like, okay, can I see it? I can't really see the date on these. So I pull, I, I like, you know, wiggle the box out, wiggle, 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 and then kind of look. And I'm like, ah, there we go. There we go. That one's fresh. And the guy's kind of looking at me and I'm like, I just kind of shrug my shoulders like, yeah. And he looks at me and goes, yeah, I understand. <laughs> like, okay. All right. He knows what I'm doing here. I, I at least try to. I at least try to push it back in so that it's not just like, you know, hanging out in the aisle. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, it's you know whatever, man. I got no shame. Let somebody else who doesn't care about how their beer tastes pick the one that's three months old sitting on top. Man, they had okay. So quick Costco beer rant. They were selling. Uh, what was it? Was it the Crux? I don't know. I can't remember. They had they had a fresh hop from somebody. It, it might have been Crux, and I, I can't remember. It might have been somebody else. Actually, no, no, no. It was it was a uh, field of ferment, is what it was. It was a Fremont. Oh, jeez. Um, they were. This was not like last week, but they were selling those uh, into December on the shelf. Um, some field of ferment, and I was like. Oh God. I almost bought one just because I wanted to see what it would taste like. Cause I can't, you can't find you them. You gotta buy four. I know that was the problem. I'm like, I'm not buying four of these. Uh, Cause I, I was kind of curious, you know, what it would taste like after, uh, you know, when it wasn't fresh anymore. Uh, but uh, I wasn't that curious. I, w- I wasn't that curious. So, but yeah, they will. If, if you are a Costco beer shopper, always check that canned on date. Uh, especially if you're dealing with IPAs, look and see if it, uh, you know, if it was in the last like, you know, six to eight weeks and, you know, a lot of times they, they are not within the last six to eight weeks. So be careful out there. Be careful. It's dangerous. Of course. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's why. But also I'll, I'll say, you know, you can go a lot of places and they'll have some old ass Bodie and old ass Lucille. Um, it, so it's not just a Costco thing. No, uh it, as cra- as quickly as Bodie especially sells, like still some places maybe buy a little too much of it. Um, but me tonight, uh, I am drinking a beer from Spokane, uh, from a newer, but not super new, but they're a couple years old at this point. Um, I think they say they started in 2018, but I don't think they've been producing like commercial beer since 2018. And that's uh, Lumber Beard out of Spokane. And they've been distributing to the west side of the state, I will say, for maybe about a year or so, year or so maybe less than a year. I don't, it hasn't been a long time. Uh, but what I'm drinking is called Chocolate Alloy 
Uh, mm. Wheat wine with vanilla and cocoa nibs aged in wheat whiskey and bourbon barrels. Uh, the wheat whiskey is that dry fly, also from Spokane wheat whiskey. I know that because on the regular alloy, which I also bought one of the, I bought uh, a can of the chocolate alloy and a can of the regular alloy at uh, my local haunt peaks and pints um very excited to try these uh because actually our our friend theo sent me a picture of um him you know picture of himself drinking these uh barley wines at you know wheat wines and barley wines at at uh at lumberbeard um and uh you know him enjoying them and and that so that i saw those and i was like hey you know, Theo had a big week. So how about a how about a beer to honor that? Um, <laughs> yes, yes, he did have a big week. Yeah. Um, hey, you're like the second interview with John Stockton in like 20 years, and it's that. Uh, congrats, pretty Theo. Good. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty good. Uh, I don't think I've seen many of your tweets like get that much engagement. <laughs> No, um, no, that was a good one. Yeah, uh, but uh, yeah, um, some of the things that John said in that Theo <laughs> must have just been like, "You're really saying this right now." That's cool. Yeah, and knowing that they're gonna publish the thing in its entirety, the the whole yeah. interview. Well, well, transfer. once he starts saying that, it's like it definitely becomes the yep. We're just publishing this thing in the entirety because otherwise, people might not believe that he said it. Like that's, yeah, that's, exactly that's when you have to make that decision to do Q and a over a written story. Right. Yeah. Make sure um, nothing's taken out of con. Make sure everybody knows nothing's yeah. taken out of con. It could have been. So people have no idea with, what we're talking about, by the way, Theo yeah. did an interview with John Stockton where John Stockton said some batshit crazy stuff about COVID vaccines, uh, including that a hundred professional athletes have dropped dead on the court. On the court, the field, or the pitch, he said. You know, that's right. Uh, on the court, the field, or the pitch, they've just dropped dead. A hundred of them. Which, it, which uh, of course, has so. not been big news. You know, no one talked no. about this. No. Yeah. Every the the media don't don't let the media hide that one from you because that that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to hide it from you. Um, yeah. He said some crazy ass shit, and uh, yeah, it was it was good good story for Theo, man, our boy Theo. I love it. So, All right. Anyway. And- Back that, to your you beer. Know, I, I, this this beer that really he well I, I knew about Lumber Beard, but he definitely put this particular beer on my radar. And then when I saw it at Peaks, I was like, "Oh, Theo had that beer the other day. I'm gonna try it." Um, so interesting. A wheat wine is kind of like a barley wine, except it's uh, with a fuck ton of of uh, malted wheat grain instead of uh, instead of you know your typical barley or or other. Um, types of malt um, so you know it's a little bit lighter in color you know it's more of a golden color than that you know uh, typical um, uh, kind of dark brown or, or, or brown you get from a, a, a barley wine so it's a little lighter in color uh, I also have the regular one but I thought the chocolate one would be interesting for the show do the more interesting one um, you definitely get a lot of vanilla uh, on the nose um, I'm always not, you know, to me, like there's already a fuck ton of like vanilla and caramel in barley wines and wheat wines. So I'm like, you know, maybe you don't need to add that stuff, but also you, there's a ton of chocolate in Imperial Stouts and it's fun when they add chocolate. So, you know, so I, I still have some sanctity with the barley wines, but also the additions I think I've done well on this. Um, it's got a, it's got a solid body, um, d- interesting barrel character with the wheat whiskey, uh, wheat whiskey is, uh, definitely, uh, you know, even if you've had a weeded bourbon, which tend to be the most popular bourbons like, uh, Willet and Pappy, you know, like the sought after ones, um, they tend to be a little more mild than just you know, some uh, other non weeded bourbons. Um, so a wheat whiskey is a little bit more mild. So like that's not as intense, but they also, it seems like they age some in bourbon barrels and some in wheat barrels. So there's some blending. So they're doing some next level shit over there in Spokane at Lumberbeard. Props to them. I'm loving seeing this. They got on my radar when they were selling a really good Pilsner for $1.99 a can, which is for a 16-ounce can, which is pretty awesome. I haven't seen it come back. I bought a bunch of it, um, at least over here. Um, So I'm hoping to see it again. 
Uh, but I, I've been seeing them really regularly. Uh, they do a lot of kind of hype styles, but they do some some good styles. The beers have having them good. This is good. Uh, so check out Lumber Beard. Check out their big beers. Check out their Pilsners. Um, I'm a I'm a fan of them so far. Also, um, I did choose the Chocolate Alloy over the Alloy uh, because there was um, in the can design. There's green and gold on Chocolate Alloy. There's a little bit of purple in there on the alloy. Oh. So I, I you know, I I try not to have beers that have purple on the show very often. Yeah, I've accidentally definitely done not it a couple on the times. Show, man. Um so so I went with the the Oregon colors, which probably would rile some up as well. The per so um you know, if if we if we lose to Colorado this weekend, you can blame me because uh the guy the the head brewer and the founder of this did go to Colorado. Um, so if, if we lose my bad, you know, yeah. my bad, yeah. uh, but now he's selling beer to kooks. So whatever. Yeah. Well, that's um, good. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, if, if I had not drank them all already, I would have had another E nine beer tonight to, uh, continue my streak. The one, the one that I would have had would have been the inner worlds, which is their pale lager, which oh, is yes. absolutely spectacular. That is a tremendous beer, and uh, I I actually can't wait until I get uh, get out there again to buy more of it because it's uh, it's so drinkable and so tasty and just yeah that's awesome. So if you can find that somewhere and you like you like lagers at all, uh, it's it's fantastic. You know, and a pale lager is kind of a cousin to a Dortmunder. So, ooh, well, <laughs> yeah. Well, now we know why I like it so much. Yeah. That yeah, makes total exactly. sense now. They almost hit the explained. colors on the can, too. You know, they had the yellow. They just needed some Yeah, black. there's some yellow. There's some yellow on there for sure. Yeah. All right. Is so time that was for beer. questions? That was beer and also other stuff. Uh, no, no, let's talk about the, the women's games real quick. Um, so they're making up one of their games, uh, Oregon State, on Wednesday. And then they also have UW on Friday and Sunday. Um, so it's actually not a, uh, my, my bad. I misspoke. Not a double header on Sunday because they're actually, um, uh, playing at UW on Sunday, uh, not at home. Um, and which is weird. It's weird. I mean, it worked out now because they could fit that Oregon state game in, but I always thought it was weird that they, like they're having two teams play each other back to back and they have them play two days apart. Like that's kind of weird. Um, but now it's going to work out. So they're playing UW twice. That's usually how they do it. Um, cause, uh, the women start the pack their tournament a week before the men. So yep. they have both of their rivalry games in the same week to make up for that yeah. one Pretty less clever, if you ask week. Me. Yeah. I mean, it would. I mean, it would kind of make sense for the men to just do it too, but whatever. Um, but yeah, so Oregon State, uh, they're kind of a, a roughly around fifty in uh, in the net. That would be, you know, you're looking at quad two at home. There, um, they're a pretty solid team. WC beat them last year. There's different players on both teams. Uh, you know. Or different players on Oregon State, and you know it, it'll be interesting. That's the toughest game. Washington, not as bad as they were last year. Still a team that WSU should beat, but not as bad as they were last year. So not quite the easy win that they were last year. But big weekend. Hopefully they can, if they can sweep the weekend, uh, that would be big for them um, after getting one in LA. Um, and then having no weekend, obviously, with the Oregon schools. So if they could somehow get a sweep out of this weekend or, uh, you know, get, you know, I, this losing to Washington, either one would be detrimental. Um, and I honestly losing to Oregon State at home would be detrimental. So if they're looking to go to the tournament, like it would be huge to get all three this weekend just to kind of, to kind of tread water, honestly. Yeah, and I think they're still in, you know, they're still in pretty decent shape. Um, you know, they their record is is certainly more impressive <laughs> than the than the men. Um, you know, but their net got, rating you know, is not. Their net rating not, is not yeah. more impressive. Yep. They they just they they have a tendency to play close games. 
Like that's yep. that's been their mo for uh, you know a couple of years now. Uh, you know things tend to kind of go one way or the other. You know last year they won a whole bunch of close games, and that was you know big part, in, including against you know big time opponents. It was a big driver for them. So uh, yeah, you know it'd be nice to have a comfortable win, but maybe that's just not. I don't know. Maybe it's not in their DNA. <laughs> uh, you know, maybe they're just not comfortable with with comfortable wins. So it would be nice to blow out Washington twice. That'd be cool. I'd be down with that. Which they did. Uh, they were able to do last year. So hopefully they can do that again. Um, so yeah, looking ahead to you know the tournament that again they need they need to win some games just like the men do. Um, and we're just kind of in that position where, Hey, five basketball wins would just be fucking great. Uh, this yes, week. it would. Um, oh, starting with so two good. on Wednesday when this drops, that would be very, yes. very good. Um, so yes, they play that, that makeup game at 1 PM. You're there. If you are listening to this before that makeup game at 1 PM, you are a gold star member. Thank you. Yep. Um, yeah. So let's let's get let's get into them questions we got questions or we don't Woo! have questions you have questions we have you have questions answers we have um, let me look at my mentions really answers. to see them let's go back reverse chronological order um we are starting one um starting with um uh uninteresting 1986 at donnie schlecht do you guys, number one, do you guys still have confidence in Coach Smith to get things on track long term at Wazoo, WSU? I'm not advocating for his dismissal, FYI. Having been a student at WSU during Tony Bennett's years, uh, me too. I long for students lined up for games again. Now, I think we're pretty far from that. At least, you know, that's not happening this season. Um, we were hoping it would be, but I will say um, I do have strong confidence that coach Smith will get things on track. Um, We're talking about his third year with a pretty young and new team. uh, And they are number 50 in Kempom. Yeah. Uh, The third year uh, Dick Bennett team was barely in the top 100. Yeah. So the, the talent that Smith's staff is he and and his staff are bringing in uh, just the philosophy that Smith has. I, I'm still very confident that he's going to bring, you know, the NCAA tournament and some big wins back to WSU. Yeah, I uh, absolutely 100% totally feel that way. I I know that the record doesn't feel like uh that they are better, but they are better. They are they are a lot better than they were last year. Um you know, by by virtually pretty much any metric you want to look at other than, you know, necessarily wins and losses, but, you know, I mean they're uh, you know, when you look at you know, what they did last year, they're, you know, they're, they're even, you know, ahead of that. I mean, they're on pace for, you know, almost 20 wins. Like, you know, after we, 20 wins doesn't mean what it used to, right? Because now there's, you know, 30, whatever games in a season, but, um, you know, you're still looking at, okay, last year, you know, we made a huge damn deal about the fact they got a winning record, right? Cause they hadn't had one of those in forever. Um, and now we're like, oh, oh, man, it's such a di- oh no, that's right. They were yeah. even. And then, yeah, then a winning. So yeah, that's right. Winning record last year. And that was a big damn deal. And now we're like, oh man, they're not going to make the tournament. What a disappointment. It's like, ah. you know, I mean, let's, let's have a little perspective. Uh, you know, that's, that's a lot. Uh, that was, that was always going to be we, a big jump. We I think we all thought, and, we all thought and they we could can, do it, but w- looking back now, uh, those, End of the season, Ken Palm rankings were probably a little, yes, um, you know, because yep. Ken, because Ken, inflated, because Ken, he uh, factors in recent wins, like recent games, pretty heavily, and so yep. all those Pac-12 teams winning all of those games against good teams elevated yep. everyone, and so yep. WSU went from the hundreds to what like the seventies. Yeah, I think went we from were like a, 103 or something, and we rose all the way to 75, right? Or and then went 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 from like, like a went, and then went to like a top 25 defense. But we can say probably WSU was not at, quite at that level last year, and then uh, you know, and then a lot of the Pac-12 teams probably just got hot at the right time. 
I mean, it was, it's just yep. an insane thing that we'll never see again, honestly. But, um, yep. and, but they are still, you know, the defense is roughly at that level that they were finished at last year. Offense is loads better. They're, they've played a tougher schedule by far than they had played at this yep. point last year. Um, they've dealt with injuries. Obviously last year they dealt with some too, but, uh, it's, yeah, they're, they're a better team. They've gotten better. I, you know, it's, it doesn't seem like, you know, it seems like they're going to hold on to a lot of the guys. It's, it's just, it, I, I'm confident this team will get better next year. And if they get better from where they are now, then like, it's not the leap that they would have to make that they would have had to make this year to be a solid NCAA tournament team that we were expecting, you know, that we were hoping that they were. Um, but if they make just any sort of gain next year, then they are a solid team, you know, so uh, a solid NCAA team. So, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I'm I'm confident. I'm still confident in Coach Smith. Um, you know, some people say he's never been to the NCAA tournament. I, But it's just he, he coached at places where that just wasn't yeah. the expectation. And <laughs> like – like this Columbia and San Francisco, like, I mean, come on, you know, you're, you're never, you're never going to make it to the tournament in the WCC. I shouldn't say never. It's really hard to make the tournament in the WCC if you're not Gonzaga or St. Mary's. St. Mary's even has a tough time, right? Like you, like you've got no chance essentially to win your conference tournament and get in that way, right? Coaching at San Francisco. So I mean, they they might have a chance this year. The teams they're pretty damn good this year, but man, that, that is that is a tough task. And then the Ivy's a one bid league, so you know when he was coaching there, I'm pretty sure they didn't have a tournament. No, they did not. Right. You had to win the league at the time that he yeah at the time he was coaching there. So um, so that also a tough assignment, right? You got to win the league to get the tournament. So uh, it's yeah, man, it's. Uh, I, the, my only concern, and it's, and it's a very mild concern, the offense, the progress with the offense has been pretty hit and miss now for three years. Um, you know, and, and so it, I think maybe it's fair to question a little bit what the upside is on the offense, uh, you know, with him directing that. But um, but I'm not, you know, I again, we've talked about the reasons why this year, the inconsistency this year, I'm not I'm not I'm not stressing too bad yet. Um Especially with the you know the potential for uh, you know a pretty elite defense uh, when all the pieces I think come together. So um, you know if you've got that, then uh, you certainly can go places. And you know then you just need to have like a you know top fifty offense or something like that. You know which uh, you know we saw with you know Tony Bennett's first team was was that kind of team with you know really, really good defense and you know just a a, a a good offense. And man, you can go a long way with that combination. All right, so um, I vote we work through these remaining questions uh, yeah. pretty quickly because both of my children are screaming their heads off and my fiance <laughs> is going to die. So, um, Rapid so fire. Let's, Here we go. Yeah. So uh, next question from Bryce, our very own Bryce Hendricks at Bryce Hendrick 14 Do you think – Smith bringing in a big in the upcoming recruited class guarantees a transfer from one of our big trio. Um, probably. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I mean, if we're putting probabilities on but it, I, but yeah. I say there's there's like a seventy five percent chance. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, because it's, it's just I. I don't know if I'd go that high. I'm not sure I go that high, but I mean, there's I'd say, just, yeah, it's just better than fifty percent. I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if like a guy. I I don't know. Yeah, like it's it's just f- from a as as Bryce brought up in the in the mentions. Uh, you know, from a roster con- construction standpoint, it's it's it brings up some issues. Uh, just to have that many guys that are basically a five, <laughs> maybe if okay. you know FA can play the four, and, and that's Muhammad why four, I but... give it maybe only just a little over fifty percent. Because, because yes, right now, right now, every single one of those guys is a five, well, right? I, 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 yeah, I think Muhammad or Fa or both need to start hitting threes That's before it. we can carry four 
seven footers, right. you know, six, ten, seven footers on our team, four or five. Yeah. One of those guys has to turn into an actual shooter. You know, like they've got to be able, they've got to have a respectable out, outside shot, preferably two. Like if, if Gay and F.A. can both start hitting threes and space the floor a little bit, they can both actually play the four. Right now with this team, it's it's really tough to play the two of them together, um, any two of the bigs together, um, because you just, you know, the spacing gets so bad and things get really clogged up and it's difficult because defenses, you know, don't have to respect – um, you know, F.A. Or, or, or Gay, whoever's sort of playing the four and spacing out to the three-point line, you know, if you don't have to respect that, that that, that makes things real tough for a team that's not all, that's already not, um, you know, super athletic, you know, trying to get to the basket. So if if one or both of those guys can, can hit from three, then, yeah, like that changes the calculus, right? Because now you're not dealing with a whole bunch of centers. Um, but... You know, who knows? Right now you've got – so for people who don't know, right now the only commit in the next class is uh, is a center. Uh, let me – sorry, let me get his name. Amenu, Amenu, right, is his last name. Amenu, yeah. Uh, Solomon Amenu uh, from – I believe he is f- also from Nigeria, if I remember right, um, although I could be wrong about that, as uh, as F.A. is. So uh, 6'10", 230, big kid. Um, not a lot out there about him right now. Um, he's still not rated by 24 seven. Um, so I don't know, super interesting to see, you know, what he turns into, but, um, yeah, you know, and maybe, I mean, who knows, you know, maybe he comes in and, you know, he's a prime candidate not that we typically red shirt guys a lot, but you know, we got two guys right now that we look like we're red shirting. So, yeah. um, you know, maybe that's, Rosario maybe that's a thing Rice. that, yeah. yeah. And Rice. So. Uh, maybe that's, you know, maybe that's actually a thing. Maybe that's there. I, you know, I don't know. Um, I, I would hate to see one of these, you know, the three bigs that we've got right now. I think we like them all for various yeah. reasons. We'd hate yeah. to see them go. Um, you know, would, would really, really like to see a chance for them, um, to develop together. If, if, if even one of them, you know, can start to shoot a little bit, uh, that makes, that, that makes a massive difference in terms of how you play rotations because right now the team is at its best when, Really at its best when it's only playing one of those guys um, at a time and, and playing somebody like Yakimovsky at the four. So, uh, But I think that's not what they want to do. I think they'd really like to be big. Um, and, and that, you know, it's it's really tough to do uh, if you're playing another athlete. Yeah, they want to play a guy like Yakimovsky at the three. So, yeah. Yeah. And then well, Noah at the two. Yakimovsky and then, Rodman you know, at the three, not at the four. Yeah. yeah. Yep. That's what you want. But haven't been able to do that. At least, I mean, they've they, they've tried. <laughs> to do that but um i think so far we've seen that you know the best lineups are the ones that feature and i don't have data to back that up but just anecdotally it seems like the best lineups are the ones that feature um a singular big and you know it's i, I think that's not what they want to do because i think that defensively obviously they're going to be at their best when they got two of those bigs on the floor yep and i said rapid fire but of course when we get them basketball questions we cannot resist um so yeah, well the they next asked the basketball question, question man the, the next question i'm going to combine two of the questions because they're very similar uh one is from uh, at donnie schlecht uninteresting 1986 again any concerns with being you two are expert i don't know if that's dripping with sarcasm or not uh Schultz yeah i don't know either Schultz passing off athletic responsibilities to Chancellor Chitton and uh, Brad the Coog, Bradley Logan uh, asks, what impacts do you foresee as a result of President Schultz giving up the president's house in Pullman to focus on the full WC system? Brad, I'm assuming you're asking about athletics because I ain't going to fucking talk about the rest of the like, <laughs> academics. I don't really care about that. No, I mean, I do, but I don't know anything. No, but you um, don't. Um, yeah, I don't. Uh, so, okay. So wh- how does this impact? How how does Schultz basically, you know, no longer being Pat Chun's boss impact the athletic department? I'm going to say that I don't know. <laughs> it's just not a very interesting podcast answer. Um, I, you know, I don't know. I mean, this is all just like inside baseball campus you know, politics, whatever. Um, I, you know, I just like, I have to believe that Schultz is going to be involved with any major decision. Like, I just think that's probably the way it's going to be. 
Um, I, I, I don't think that Schultz like needs to be involved. Like if Pat Chen leaves and they need yeah. to hire a replacement? Need another AD, you know, he's going to have his finger on that. You know, I think, um, or if, you know, we got a, you know, football coaching change or a contract situation where, you know, we need to fire somebody or whatever. I mean, it's, you know, I absolutely think he's going to be involved. I think that there's, I honestly don't think there's going to be much of a difference, uh, between, you know, switching from him to Chilton. I, I think the big thing is you've still got somebody at the top of the system that, um, is, you know, really tuned into the importance of sports, really understands the importance of sports. Um, as they talk about, you know, the, the front door, front porch to the university. And I think that that's not going to change. So, um, that, that makes, I, I think, you know, that's, if, if anything made you feel comfortable, that that's what I would say is, is just thinking like, um, you know, the guy at the very top understands the value of, of athletics. And so that, that should make you feel pretty good. I think. All right. Next question, which I think is the easiest one, um, from Eric at totes mixed dose. Um, or I don't know, maybe I said your last name wrong or maybe that's not your last name. I don't know. Uh, so Eric asks butter or margarine. <laughs> Yeah, so you have a you have strong thoughts on this, Craig. Well, I want to hear yours. Mine, okay. Mine is uh, it depends on how broke you are. Uh, I grew up on margarine. We were uh, you know, not <laughs> exactly. The, not, That's exactly not what the I was most. Say. <laughs> yeah, not the most well off family in the world. So uh, you know, lots of margarine in my household, and uh, it was into my adulthood before I realized like people actually ate butter. Like for my family, butter was like that treat you got when you went to the buffet and you get the rolls and then or the like, butter would be in the little if, like cubes, you know, if, if butter was on like a crazy sale, my parents would yeah. buy it like Thanksgiving time, right. As a treat or Christmas and you'd have time. It, like leftover for like the next yeah. week. You're like, Oh my God. Yeah. You know, we'd go to, we'd go to the old country buffet and, you know, they'd have the butter in the little, you know, wrapped little rectangles, right? And, uh, you know, I'd take that out and put it on my roll, and I'd be like, oh, this tastes so good. And my dad's like, yeah, that's real butter. <laughs> I'm, like, so, I'm like, I didn't, don't even understand the difference, you know, and then I get older and I realize, oh, yeah, that's that's the difference. So, yeah, so if we're, depends we're on saying- how much you how much money you make. Across the board, if if money is no object, across the board – uh, there's only one area where margarine maybe has the edge and that's spreadability when it's cold. Indeed. You can Indeed. you can spread it on your whatever and it, yep. it does it just fine. And I think that's their yep. big selling point. But everywhere else, yep. have you – I don't know. So I make a lot of like popcorn at home, not – you know, yep. I, I have something called a Whirly Pop and it makes delicious Ooh. popcorn. Yes. And yep. my we parents had that – my parents had a Whirly Pop growing up too and – I made a lot of popcorn at home. I get home from school. I make a popcorn. If we had margarine, that shit just soaks into the popcorn and like yes. just make like it just it's so gross. Like it just drenches it. And yes. but like butter nicely kind of like coats it and and, and you know, like it so, tastes better. <laughs> like butter tastes better. Uh, it's it's just better overall. Um, it's. You know, it's it's just it's not even like n- neither one is healthier. I don't think <laughs> like it's no. just it, it, the only advantage that margarine has is it's cheaper, which sometimes which obviously matters. And then it does matter. It's it spreads better on a piece of bread when it's cold, yes. which is yes, honestly an excellent thing. Like I've bought in the spreadable butter before, just because it's like. Yeah, this is nice, you know. Like, I, yeah. Like, when you make your toast, you're like jamming the cold piece of butter into, it yeah, and waiting for it to worst. melt. <laughs> yeah, but but otherwise, I, I will say this: did uh, did did your parents do this where they called the margarine butter when you were a kid? Oh, hundred percent, hundred. Oh yeah. Okay, <laughs> so there was a moment. I and I don't know when this moment was, but the moment at which I realized the butter we had at home was not butter. Like, right, because they called it butter and get the butter and, you know, get, you know, whatever. And then, like, at some point I realized that, like, real butter actually was different and tasted different, you know. It's like, man, we cooked with margarine. Like, we made uh, mac- macaroni and cheese out of a cra- craft macaroni and cheese. was my favorite meal when I was a kid. Um, 
is still my favorite meal when I'm an adult, if, if the truth is to be told. But, um, yeah, making it, you know, making it with margarine, like, you know, and then I realized like sometime I got older and I went, wait a second, like, wait, this isn't butter. <laughs> I don't, it took a while. It took a while before I realized it wasn't butter. Um, so yeah. 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 It's, it's, uh, it, yeah, there's just, it, I, I will say one story about Mar. So I would always use margarine, obviously make, um, macaroni and cheese or whatever. And there was one time I was, I, I was 12 years old and, over the summer, babysat three kids plus my sister, three of our friends' kids, and I was making them macaroni and cheese for lunch, and the macaroni tasted like soap, and I was like, why the hell does this taste like soap? And I go up in the Fred Meyer Value margarine, and you can see a coating of soap, like soap on like it's like soap bubbles on the top of it like that is how it came from the store how did that happen i don't (laughs) know gross i've never had that happen with butter another point how does that happen all right all right let's move on Uh, to yeah that's so disgusting marcus paul burns one of our one of our most loyal of uh twitter followers and listeners at mbp the three do you think the Pac-12 puts four teams to the NCAA men's basketball tourney? Well, after Oregon I'm gonna lost say, tonight? I'm going to say yes. You're going to say yes? I think yes. Who's yeah. number four? Uh, Oregon or us. I also See. think Colorado could do it. I still Colorado's think Colorado got a long way to go on the, old, uh, on the old net ranking. They do. They do. But they could do it. Um, so... I think that it, and remember, I mean, it's, uh, you know, we're also dealing with somebody could win the conference tournament as well. Yeah. Right. So there, there are lots of ways we could get to Which, a fourth team. I think that's the best way that Oregon gets in. Honestly. Yes. So I think there's a lot of ways we could get to a fourth team. Um, you know, there's still lots of time left, half a season left in terms of the, uh, you know, the conference schedule. So yeah, still lots of time for things to get weird. And, and I, yeah, I think that it, Again, the the best thing the conference has going for them is they've got three really good teams. So anytime you beat one of those really good teams, it's it's a really good win. In the years when the conference has been locked into just two or three teams, the hardest part there has been, you know, for anybody else to make some noise to get in there has been kind of impossible because there's no no quality wins on your schedule. So um you know, that's, I think that's the thing, you know, WSU even, you know, has an, I mean, what if they go out and they beat UCLA, USC, uh, and Arizona, right? Like now granted it's only three games and, but let's, let's say they win all three of those. Like, okay, well now all of a sudden everything looks really, really, really different. Right. So the opportunity is there. Not that necessarily, you know, I don't think WSU is going to do that. And I don't think necessarily anybody else is going to do that, but but there's an opportunity there to pick up some wins. And, you know, the, the thing I want to keep reminding people is, you know, every year, every damn year, people are like, oh, this is the weakest bubble ever. Like they say that every fucking year, every year, it's the weakest bubble ever. Well, guess what? That's because the teams on the bubble always kind of suck, like relatively speaking. So, you know, everybody's got warts. Everybody's got flaws. And so just, you know, don't, don't paint yourself into a corner thinking like, well, this team has no chance. And, you know, as it turns out, you know, a lot of teams that aren't very good, uh, relatively speaking, do get into the tournament. Yeah. And, you know, I'll, uh, I'll agree with you. I think one of Oregon, us or Colorado will get in. I, I think it's more likely that one of those three wins the tournament randomly, yep. There's a lot of like I I I think it's less likely that they build up a resume because both of them, well, Oregon is the closest on a resume, but if they don't beat Colorado at home, then they're fucking themselves over. Um, I was ready to say hell yeah, Oregon's be number four, and then they lost like during like before the podcast lost. I'm like, come on guys! But as you said, everyone has warts. Oregon just needs to win a lot of games, or we need to win a lot of games. If one of the two of those teams wins like 
of their last how many games are left like 15 like if they win like you know 10 to 11 of those they're probably going to be on the bubble and then they have a chance so yeah um yeah so i i guess let's go four because three is depressing um the next question from garrett foster at g foster fit the devil wants to make a deal with you a WSU football 15 and 0 national championship season in 2022 followed by 20 consecutive Apple Cup losses do you take it oh man that is that is so tough look um, i'm going to say okay. yes because here's the thing those 20 consecutive apple cup losses could happen anyway but That's you know true. what i know i have a bird in the bush or whatever the fuck they say is worth, like, I don't know, a bird in your hand is worth two in the bush or whatever the fuck they say. I'm taking a bird in my hand and also it's a bird that's never going to fucking happen otherwise without the devil's help. 20 We're not going years to... is a long time though. Okay, Man, Jeff, do 20... you think in the next 20 years WSU would win a national championship? No, but what I'm saying is like, like we are... I mean, just Jeff, have you context. felt an Apple Cup win before? We're, I mean, just put it this way. Answer We're the question. Have even... you felt an Apple Cup win before? I have. Have you, have you, do you know what that feels like? I do. Do you know what a national championship feels like? I've come close. Close. No, no, you don't. No, you haven't. They were, they were close in 97, man. Yeah. yeah they, they were beat, only they two beat wins Michigan, away. If they had beat Michigan, they had they, a pretty they, no. They weren't decent. They weren't claim. It's Washington State University. They would have not. I'm sorry. They, they would have not. There was another <laughs> undefeated Heisman team. Finalist. There was another undefeated team. Michigan Who? shared the national championship with they Tennessee. Did? Not Tennessee. I don't remember that. Did, wasn't there another undefeated team? I don't think so. I don't think so, man. I don't know. I'm going to have to look this up now. I I forget. That was a long time ago. No, it was Nebraska. Like, Nebraska was the other undefeated team. There was whatever. two undefeated we teams. WC was not we're, winning the national championship that we were year, fucking even better if than they Nebraska. beat Michigan. We were close. Yeah. They just need to be Arizona State <laughs> first. No. I know. But did I was you at that feel game too. a national championship, Jeff? No, no. No, I didn't. No, I did not. I did not. That's true. I, I would say this 20 years is just so long that we are not even 20 years out from our last Rose bowl. And that was a long time ago. So I don't know, man, that is a tough boy. I, I know the point of these questions is to put you in a, uh, in a tough position. I'm taking the national championship. I don't care. Yeah. I, I, th like, I think I might. I think Cause I if, might. if we went 10 and 10 in apple cups, but still, like, there's you got shitty ten years in there. Yeah, but I, I can I ride that. I can ride. I could ride a WSU football national championship for the rest of my life. I would be a UW, UW 1991 half a championship fan, like exactly <laughs> that. Like I would. I they do that. I would do it too. I would just bring it up all the time because it would literally be. The most improbable thing I've ever seen. That is true. Like, <laughs> a, co a college football playoff would be like a, a, a CFP championship would be pretty damn epic. To got, go like, like yeah. to see WSU win those two games yeah. would be so. I, I agree. Cool. I agree with that. To beat probably Alabama and Georgia like in a row. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I I agree. I I think you've talked me into it. You've talked me into it. I think I think I'd go for that. All right. So next question, Ben Thoen. I, I know I'm saying your name wrong, man. <laughs> at Ben Thoen. Sorry. At Ben underscore T-H-O-E-N. <laughs> um, uh, what type of changes or trends? God damn it. More basketball, Jeff. We're trying to be quick. What type of changes or trends would you like to see rest of the season with the men's hoop squad? There's a lot of questions here. Who is an organization cornerstone? In the okay, let's let's take these one at a time. What type? Okay, quickly, Jeff. What types of changes or trends? My first trend would be win the close games, win them. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Could, can we That'd just be the big one? On that? Yeah. Uh, I, how do we win those? Uh, 
Just I don't be know, more man. consistent offensively. Be luckier. Generally. Just be luckier. Be lucky. I don't know. Hit a couple more threes, I guess. I don't fucking know. Yeah. Um, next question. Who is an organization cornerstone and needs more time on the floor? So I'm assuming someone that doesn't get a lot of time on the floor right now would need more. I mean, I, I guess I'm leaning towards like Yaki probably deserves more time on the floor yeah. at this point, and, I mean, and he'll probably be a big right piece. Now. I know. Yeah, there's not, I don't. Everyone's getting so much time right now. Maybe Miles Rice, I guess. Yeah. You know, we need a fucking point guard. So Yeah, he's the guy who hasn't he's like the one guy who actually hasn't played much. That's my answer. Miles Rice. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't so, really have you know, I guess I would say like I would say Deshaun Jackson because he just isn't playing at all. So that that would be yeah. my guy. Uh, he yeah, just just, can we at there. least get some minutes out of him? That yeah. would be great. Oh, uh, by the way, great. WSU dropped back to fifty one. Damn it. Uh, in the middle of our podcast. No longer top 50. Um, so the next question is, who is hurting more than they are helping? Oh, I I don't think anybody, really. I don't think I don't anybody. Know. Does anybody come to mind for you? If you, if you? If you pull my arm and made me answer, but it's only on one end of the floor, would be Noah. Okay. I think offensively, Noah probably hurting more than helping sometimes because he is taking yeah. too many shots. But also, yeah. it's kind of the and bonton the threes aren't falling. That's, that's a major The threes problem. aren't falling. Yeah, if he's hitting the threes, he's taking 43, which is a lot for a guy that's only shooting 21%. You know, that's a lot for, you know, he's taking, he's taking two a game yep. for a guy that's only shooting, you know, more than two a game. That's only shooting 20%. That's too much. Yep. So I think offensively and definitely at the end of game, sometimes when he tries to take over, it's been hurting. Uh, but overall, no, he's the guy we need on the floor. Yes. He's, he's a, he's a, he's, he's a net positive. Yep. Um, literally if he was shooting 30% from three, he would be having a fine season yep. offensively. Um, but yeah, so if, you know, if you twist my arm, I'll, I'll say that. Cause otherwise the rest of the guys are kind of, you know, what, what you would expect out of them. Honestly, yep. I don't, I, I don't know. Yeah. They're, again, they're pretty good. They just lost a bunch of fucking stupid games. I don't know. <laughs> exactly. Um, uh, let's go. What is this other one? What type of development down the stretch would most satisfy you? Uh, well, winning a bunch of games, is that lame? Uh, I guess, I guess the, the one development would be to have no more scoring, uh, like stretches without scoring of more than three minutes. Yes. <laughs> I, I, that would be the development. <laughs> yeah, that would be the development. No and then 10 I minute think they scoring would, droughts. I, I think they would win a lot more games if that happened. I think they I, honestly I would. I think you're probably right. Um, Good questions. Three all in one. Um, here's an interesting one. Uh, Cameron Conley at Staff for Die. Which team will you feel better about going to fall of 22, Tottenham or WC football? Spurs. Yeah, I'm going to go That's Spurs because I, I think Kane is not going anywhere in the transfer portal, the yeah. transfer windows. Not, not with so, Antonio Conte now. I, I think, yeah, I think feels like the team's moving in the right direction. They've got money to spend. They're poised to add a, some people who can help. I there's think, a, I think they're on pretty, the right track, especially if they can actually play the games they've missed from COVID. Yeah. They've pretty got good chance games they in can, hand. Yeah. If they, they pretty good chance they can, you know, sneak into that number four and, Kane's definitely staying if they have Champions League. So, yep. Um, yeah, I feel better. WC football, there's just, again, like at this season, which turned out to be fine, uh, there's a lot of question marks. Yeah. They lose in a lot of offensive production, a lot of defensive production. Uh, there's, there's just a lot of question marks. So yeah. it but doesn't Tottenham, mean I'm super down on the Cougs, but like, I think Tottenham's ceiling is. Fairly substantial yeah. next season. Tottenham, Tottenham has a high ceiling. Also a tougher uh, league, but also a high ceiling. Uh, they got the money, you know, whatever. They, Yeah, I, I agree with you. Tottenham. Um, and I, okay. Uh, one more from at Brad the Coog, Bradley Logan. 
should Beasley be fully torn down and an entirely new facility built for basketball, or should WSU go with an extensive remodel instead? Um, I mean, I would I would think a remodel, right? Like, I mean, it's it's a good sized building. You would think they could work uh, within that footprint. Um, you know, I, I think typically colleges tend to remodel and renovate more than they tear down and rebuild. Um, so I, I can't imagine that they'd be better off, you know, starting from scratch. Any, whatever they're going to do is going to be on that footprint. So, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I I think, I don't think, I think so. There's the good bones in there. Just add, add some luxury seats. Probably, you know, like they did with the football stadium, reduce the overall capacity, but increase really about generating possibility for revenue. It's not to make it a nicer place. It's not to make it a. Uh, you know, better for the players or whatever. As, as much as we'd like to believe that, that's not what it's about. It's about can we figure out ways to generate some more revenue? You know, suites, boxes, you know, be courtside good. seats, things like that. That's yeah, what they need. Boxes, the courtside seats they've been working on. You can tell by the way how they've arranged things. But if they can have boxes, you know, where people can you know hang like a suite type thing, a club type thing. That that's that's the revenue driver. That's that's what attracts people to spend money on basketball. Um, so yeah, uh, I'm gonna go with the remodel. The that that place yep. is plenty big enough. Just rip it, you know, rip out that that top level that only fills up every ten years. And yeah, and I think we'll be fine without it. Um, there's a lot more uh, successful basketball program that plays just up the road from us and only has a six thousand seat arena. Who probably wishes they had our our arena, honestly. Um, yeah. But uh, but yeah. So that's all the questions. That's all of them. We did it. Um, we did it. I've only gotten three more texts from Amanda, uh, but uh, she did just ask when we're going to be done. And you know what, Amanda, we're going to be done right about now. As I'm going to say, uh, follow us on Twitter at the Craig Powers at Pod vs Everyone for Jeff. Um, follow or send us an email if you have questions podcast vs everyone at gmail.com i haven't gotten an email in a long time come on folks um yeah not with questions at least um and yeah thanks to randy england for the music and jeff i will say go kooks go kooks craig black lives matter black lives do matter get fucking vaccinated yeah talking to you john stockton (laughs) 